Liu Su says she cried all day when she got it done, and the memory is still upsetting. She has kept two pairs of shoes. These were actually too big for her. Have you ever felt pressured to change your appearance in order to better fit the beauty standard? In society, there are surely a lot of benefits that come with being deemed attractive. But how far would you go to achieve this? Would you put your body in serious danger? Endure excruciating pain? How about permanently disfigure a part of your body in a way that would have a huge impact on the rest of your life? You might think that you would never give up so much in the name of beauty, but when everyone else is doing it and you have no chance of finding love if you refuse, you don't really have a choice. 91-year-old P. Shu shows an interviewer the severe ways her feet were bound in order to reshape them. Even after all these years, she can't forget the agonizing pain and suffering that she had to endure as her feet were broken and bound. For the rest of her life, she lived in pain, all in the name of beauty. And the practice of foot binding just might be the most painful thing that has been done to achieve a standard of beauty throughout history. For P. Shu and a dwindling number of elderly women just like her, this practice was forced upon them at a young age, but they were unlucky enough that in their lifetime, the trend finally reached its end, making it so that the small feet these women had sacrificed so much to gain now made them subject to heartless public ridicule. <laughs> the 94-year-old's feet are badly deformed. What's up, Iwu crew? It's the Raven, back to share more shocking, interesting, or strange, but very true historical facts that you probably didn't learn in history class. Before we get started, I must warn you that this piece of history is disturbing. The exact origin of foot binding is actually a bit of a legend. It's said to have started in the 10th century and was inspired by one woman alone, a court dancer named Yao Nyang had apparently tightly bound her feet in order to represent the shape of a new moon or to make them hoof-like. In some versions of this story, Yao Nyang is a dancer and also one of the emperor's favorite concubines. As the story goes, Emperor Li Yu, who ruled one region of China between 961 and 975, became entranced by the way that Yao Nyang could dance just on her toes while inside a six-foot golden lotus festooned with ribbons and precious stones. This became known as the Lotus Dance. The other women of the court, or other concubines, depending on the story, started to imitate the distinct shape of Yao Nyang's feet because of how much the emperor enjoyed them. In another legend, the practice of foot binding began when it was ordered by a Shang empress who had a club foot this story goes that in the court she made foot binding a compulsory practice. No matter the exact origin story, the practice of foot binding started to spread, but mostly among the women of the court and the elite. This made bound feet a sign of status and became very fashionable. Small feet also began to represent ideal femininity and was a symbol of refinement just like how a tiny waist was desired in Victorian England. Though it started as a courtly practice, it grew in popularity across China, and over multiple dynasties it began to spread out into the countryside. It spread until it was common across most of China by the 19th century. Not only were bound feet an expectation for women, but the size of her bound feet would actually dictate how good of a marriage the young girl would be able to make. Bound feet of a certain size became translated into a type of currency. The most desirable foot size was a mere three inches, called golden lotus. Just take a second to imagine what that might look like. Four-inch feet were called silver lotus and were still a respectable size, though not as desirable as the golden lotus. Five-inch feet, however, had the name of iron lotus and held little currency. Women with golden lotus feet could bring upward mobility to their families through good marriages into money, but the girls with iron lotus feet may have occasionally struggled to make a match. 
This excruciating practice started at a shockingly young age, so I have to warn you that the next descriptions are pretty disturbing. Foot binding began when the girls were as young as four or six, but sometimes they were as young as three years old, or even as old as 12. One woman who had her own feet bound as a child commented on the young age that foot binding first starts by saying that young bones are soft and break more easily. As well, if the binding took place too late, the girl's feet would have already grown too large to fit the ideal golden lotus. The ritual of foot binding was also seen as a rite of passage for young girls and was believed to be a symbol of their willingness to obey the men in their lives, usually their father and then later their husbands. The main reason that foot binding didn't start even earlier was because very young girls couldn't actually deal with the pain that came with binding. Her daughter talked us through the binding process of breaking each toe apart from the big toe and wrapping them tightly under the sole of the foot to create a single point. It has caused her mother a lifetime of pain. It was believed that if they were just a little bit older, then they could be told the reasons behind the agonizing pain they would endure. As well, some sources say that binding usually started in the winter because it was believed that the colder air helped numb the pain. The actual process of binding feet was harrowing. It was often done as part of a traditional ritual that would include practices intended to ward off bad luck. Earlier in the history, the process of foot binding started with women's toes being taped in triangular points, their feet beaten and then rubbed with herbs and oils in order to encourage the skin to loosen. Then the feet would be forced into small lotus shoes. Some research suggests that the earliest form of foot binding was aimed to make the feet more narrow, but didn't actually affect the bones too much. After time, though, the process became more practiced. It began with the young girl's feet soaking in hot water, followed by clipping her toenails, followed by massaging the feet with oil. Now, here's the part that's hard to hear, and even harder to imagine enduring. All of the girl's toes, except for the big one, were broken and pressed down so that they were flat against the sole of the foot. The foot was then bound to create a triangle shape before the girl's arch was strained as the foot was bent double. What this looked like was curling the foot in on itself. The very last piece of this incredibly painful and grueling process was that a 10 foot long strip of silk was wrapped around to completely bind the feet. This binding not only kept the broken toes in the desired place, but also prevented the feet from continuing to grow. A disturbingly grotesque pedicure. From the age of seven, she would have to do this every day or face a beating from her parents. It was very sore. Now, the entire process sounds almost unbearable, and I couldn't help my own cringe researching this topic, but the initial excruciatingly painful breaking was only the beginning. In order to ensure that the arches of the girl's feet broke, they were forced to walk on their bound feet for long distances. The long walks would help to use the girl's weight to crush their broken bones into the desired shape. This would help to force the girl's toes closer to their heel and make the foot shorter. The walking also brought circulation into the bound feet. The upkeep of this process was no easier. The layers of wrapping had to be taken off every two days to allow the feet to be washed or else blood and pus could possibly cause an infection in the feet, which would make it even more painful. Some sources say that if ingrown toenails got infected, that they would actually have to be peeled back and removed completely. Often the excruciating pain of having four toes broken and crushed into the sole of the foot was only made worse by infections or even gangrene. If there was any excess skin or nail out of the desired triangle shape of the lotus, it would be cut off with a knife or measures were taken to make sure those pieces rotted and fell off. Sometimes the process of foot binding actually caused paralysis or ulceration, and in very rare cases, it could even cause death. 
Foot binding took about two to three entire years until the process was finally completed. The final result was a cleft between the bent toes and the sole of the foot that was just wide enough for a coin to wedge between. The resulting tiny bound foot was viewed as an example of physical perfection, but only if it was the ideal three inches. By the end of the ordeal, the bound feet would be triangular, bowed, and pointed in shape. Their heeled, broken feet would almost resemble a woman's high heel because of the angle of the heel and slope that her toes would take on. The girls would then have to relearn how to walk on their new feet, something that was excruciatingly painful now. A woman could be recognized as having her feet bound not just by her feet, but actually by the way that she walked with a very distinct gait. They essentially could only walk directly on their big toes and heel bones, which meant that they usually took small, stunted steps. It has been described that the women with foot bindings moved almost as if they had hooves. For the rest of their lives, these women would suffer from weakened bones and ligaments, and when they got older, they were more likely to require crutches or canes, often too, in order to help them get around. Once the feet were set in the desired shape, women had to continue wearing the binds and leggings over the top with tiny decorative silk shoes. For the first few years, the feet would be in almost unbearable pain most of the time. But after years and years, the toes became numb until eventually the women no longer had any pain in their feet at all. Over almost a thousand years, millions of women in China had their feet bound. However, there are some estimates that put that number astronomically higher. Any woman who wanted to marry had bound feet. The only ones who didn't were the very poor, or the women who worked in fishing as they couldn't risk being off balance in the boats with bound feet. If you're wondering if women ever try to undo their bound feet, they couldn't really. Not unless they wanted to suffer almost the same exact experience, but in reverse. It's believed by some that over time, the practice of binding became even more extreme, as skeletal remains show that in the beginning, women's feet were only slightly reduced in size, but compared to women later in history, their feet were made to be even smaller. There's a historical debate about what may have actually been the reason that foot binding held so much status and currency for women for such a long time. Some believe that one of the main reasons that feet were bound in the beginning is because men liked women with small feet and that there was a male erotic fascination of women with such small feet. However, many people think that this may only be one part of a combination of complex factors. And with this comes an idea that may surprise you to learn, especially after realizing just how horrendously painful foot binding was, is that the three inch golden lotus foot was actually thought to be the ultimate erogenous zone. In fact, there is a book from the Qing dynasty that actually lists 48 different ways of playing with bound feet. Another belief about bound feet was that they were supposed to help increase a woman's fertility the reasoning behind this was that it was believed that the binding helped the blood flow up into the legs, hips, and uterus. There are another few interesting theories about why the practice continued for so long. Women with bound feet found that their tiny feet really restricted their movements. Zhou Guijin spoke about her bound feet and said that, I can't dance, I can't move properly. Some historians believe that beyond making good marriages, the practice of foot binding may have also been encouraged because of the way that it would limit how far women could even leave their homes, as they couldn't move with ease, and so it would help them keep their chastity. This theory also believes that foot binding made women have to rely more heavily on men. But there's new research that suggests this lack of mobility may have also had another purpose, especially in the countryside. There, girls were expected to help aid the family economically, not just through a good marriage, but especially by making things like fishing nets, yarn, mats, cloth, and shoes. Binding a young girl's feet kept them still and working with their hands to contribute to the family's income because they physically struggled to move. 
They would be sedentary for long hours on end for the years their feet were being broken and bound, and the years after, which is why it was such an advantage to put them to work. Even when the practice of foot binding became less popular, it still continued in areas where things like cloth were useful to be made at home. It's notable that the age that girls started to spend cloth and cotton is the same age that feet are usually bound. And it's believed by some that there's a correlation between the times when factories made homemade items obsolete and less foot binding. In the 17th century, the Manchus tried to ban the practice of foot binding. The reasoning behind this attempted ban wasn't because of the foot binding itself, but rather what it represented. Again, in 1662, during the Qing Dynasty, there was another attempted ban, but it was actually withdrawn only a few years later in 1668, because foot binding was still so widely practiced. Then in 1874, a British priest started the very first anti-foot binding committee in Shanghai. Around this time, more Westerners started moving to China, and with them they brought strong advocates against foot binding. Even after foot binding became less popular, the poor women whose feet were already bound were often subjected to horrible treatment. Even though they had just been conforming to the beauty standards of their time, some of them could be totally abandoned by their husbands, who no longer wanted wives with tiny feet, as it wasn't fashionable anymore. And Eskimo pies for Chinese consumption. Soda fountains outmode traditional tea houses. And in some cases, it was even worse. When women with bound feet were spotted in the streets of big cities, people would humiliate them by cutting off their bindings. This was especially horrible because these women rarely ever showed their feet without coverings, not even to their husbands. This might be the most shocking and saddening part of all. As I was researching this topic, I couldn't stop wondering if anyone actually found the sight of the bound feet attractive. But these reports that women would rarely ever reveal their bare feet, even to their partners, makes me feel even more sad for the girls, who had to endure the pain and discomfort of their unnaturally tiny feet, all while keeping them wrapped up in pretty shoes for the rest of the world to see. But the belittling of these women was even eventually encouraged by Chairman Mao, who said that women with bound feet could be publicly humiliated. In 1912, foot binding was officially banned for the first time when the Qing Dynasty ended. Three years later, fines started to be given out when bound feet were discovered, but this didn't actually stop it from happening. Girls' feet were still bound, but this time in secret. Inspectors came to Zhou Guijin's house, and her mother would bandage her feet and put normal-sized shoes on them to trick them into thinking she had big feet. During the 1950s, these women were especially shunned because the Communist Party often required hard physical labor, and these women struggled to work in the fields and alongside their families. Sometimes they even had to work digging reservoirs, which was incredibly difficult work for the average person, never mind the women with bound feet, who suffered even more pain. Because they were in so much pain and so restricted in their movements, their entire families could fail to complete their quotas for production and would have to deal with food shortages because of it. On the other hand, after foot binding was stopped by the majority of China, some of the women whose feet were bound actually gained fame and even formed a touring bound feet disco dancing troupe. Here's something that may shock you to learn. Some of the last women to have their feet bound are still alive. The woman who I quoted earlier about how young bones are soft and therefore easier to break is named Wang Lifun. She is one of the last women to have her feet bound, but though she's part of the last generation, there were at least 1,800 women who were living with bound feet in the mid-2000s. Just back in 2007, she gave an interview to NPR where she said that at 79, she doesn't remember how painful it was to have her toes and arch of her foot broken when her feet were bound by her mother at age seven. However, even then, after 72 years of healing, she says that contrary to the belief that her feet should be numb now, they still sometimes hurt so much she can't even put them down on the ground. 
Wang Lifun's story is one that shows that foot binding was actually something that the girls who underwent the grueling process believed they actually needed, as her mother died during the process, and so Wang chose to continue binding her own feet. She said that she didn't actually want to bind her feet, but really felt like she had to, and that the pressure came from her entire village. Just like at the beginning, when feet were first being bound, Wong's in-laws had required their son to marry a woman with small feet. Because of Wong's bound feet, their marriage was arranged, and she met him for the first time at their wedding. Today, there are very few women alive who still have bound feet. But those who are, are living history. Pi She was pleased to see the practice eradicated and is envious of the freedom enjoyed by young women today.